Okay, time to remake a video that I have already made due to a typo. In the case of this video, it actually wasn't a very bad typo, and for the severity that it was being so minor, I would normally just note it in the description, but for some reason, the typo in this particular video irritates me more than usual. I don't really know why, it just does, so I'm gonna fix it anyway. Let's do this. In this video, we're gonna solve the Dirac equation for relativistic Landau levels, again, but in a different way. In my previous video, we solved this problem extremely quickly and elegantly, with the same raising and lowering operator definitions as you can use to solve the Schrodinger version of this problem. But that method isn't very general. While it is really cool and wonderful to use when you can, it's not like you can usually solve the Dirac equation for most systems as elegantly with a method that looks anything like that. So it's worth using any exactly solvable problems that we know about, even if there is a raising and lowering operator option, to apply more generally applicable techniques for practice. It's also the case that when you see how much longer and less convenient the power series method, which is what we'll be using in this video, is compared to the raising and lowering operator method, it will perhaps help you appreciate the raising and lowering operator method all the more. Now, it's most convenient, as far as I have found, to apply the power series method in Cartesian coordinates and with this gauge, or at least a very similar one. This is the gauge that we used in my Schrodinger video, which I will link to in the description. It's the one called Solving the Schrodinger Equation for an electron in a constant magnetic field in the z direction. This particular vector potential is one choice for a vector potential that corresponds to a magnetic field in the z direction. To make the calculation easier, I'm also going to use natural units. This is the raw Dirac equation without the natural units imposed or the momentum operator formulas inserted. Doing that gets us straight to here. Now we know the particle is free in the z direction, so we're going to have a phase factor for the z dependence in the wave functions. And we can also take advantage of x momentum operator commutativity with the Hamiltonian, at least in this gauge, to select an ansatz that also forces kx to be a valid quantum number, meaning we include x dependence with another similar phase factor. You might recognize recognize this ansatz as well from my video on the Schrodinger analog of this problem. Inserting it leaves us with this form for the full Dirac equation. Here we notice an inconvenient truth. We need four distinct matrices to describe the complete Dirac equation for this problem, at least in this coordinate system and in this gauge. This is obviously inconvenient because that would force us to use a four-dimensional representation. However, we can actually bypass this problem using a little bit of cleverness. Not as much cleverness as we used in the latter operator method, but still a little bit of cleverness. Notice that two of these terms proportional to distinct matrices are also proportional to constant, k, z, and m, which are not at all coupled to each other in the full equation. If we solve separately the massless case and the k, z equals zero case, we'll find that the full answer can be constructed from these special cases uniquely, given that they're completely uncoupled in the full equation. Let's handle the massless case first. This is the equation we need to solve. We now have only three distinct matrices by design, and therefore we can select a 2D representation. The Pauli matrices are a particularly convenient choice for that. Multiplying all that out ultimately leaves us with this pair of equations. It turns out that the same coordinate transformations that we used in the Schrodinger equation video, the portion on eigenfunctions, also simplifies things down quite conveniently here. First of all, we can shorten these first terms, and then we can simplify it further by rescaling the variables as as long as we also introduce these constants. The equations we get are satisfyingly simple. At this point, one might guess that the next step is to start taking limits on these equations to discover asymptotic forms capable of turning them into ones that give useful recurrence relations. This guess is essentially correct, but doing so isn't necessarily trivial and can require some experimentation at least in general, and that was the case here. The first thing I tried was to use substitution to get second order equations, but their large row limit equations didn't yield very useful asymptotic forms. I then tried taking the same limit on the first order equations, 
And I got two answers, which isn't terribly surprising. One, which is an exponentiated positive square, this non-normalizable, and the other one is this nice normalizable Gaussian. I therefore only had one choice, and that was to try and use this as the asymptotic form for the large row limit of both components. Further experimentation confirmed that using this Gaussian as the large row asymptotic form for both components yielded functional recurrence relations, at least once we substituted to get second order equations, even without considering the small row limit. Sometimes you don't need an asymptotic form for the small row limit. You kind of have to experiment to see exactly what asymptotic forms work and what ones you even need. That's all part of the game of solving differential equations via the power series method in the general case. Regardless, that leaves us with this ansatz and this pair of first order equations and ultimately, via substitution, this pair of second-order equations. And with these final second-order equations in front of us, we're ready to apply the power series, inserting these into our equations and doing the normal incrementation of the index that we need to do in order to be able to factor out the rho to the n factor and take the coefficients equal to zero gets us these recurrence relations. In the same way as in the power series treatment in my Schrodinger equation problems, it's pretty easy to show from these recurrence relations that non-normalizable solutions are yielded by a failure to terminate them, so we terminate. Notice that we have to do n max plus two given how these recurrence relations work. We get n plus two from the nth one. Imposing these on our recurrence relations then gets us these equations. If we solve them out, we arrive at these energy eigenvalues and we see that they do match the results from my last video. We can therefore combine these solutions as we did there by inventing the same new quantum number. We arrive here. Next we can do the other half of the problem where we restore the mass but set kz equal to zero. That gives us this equation. We see that this equation is exactly the same, at least if we pick this perfectly valid representation for the needed matrices as the equation that we solve to get these, except where the m parameter is replacing the kz parameter, which means we simply immediately see that we have this solution. Now, as stated above, the mass and kz being uncoupled in the general equation means that there's only one consistent way to combine these special cases to get the energy eigenvalues of the general equation. And here we have that result. It is exactly the same as the general result that we got in my ladder operator video. So there you go. You can also do it with the power series method, and it is great practice working with the Dirac equation using a more generally applicable technique than the ladder operator method is, however elegant it may be. I hope this video is interesting. Thanks for watching.